Good morning. We are starting the second day of uh, our symposium, Simbath, the Seven Sea Edition. And uh, I would like to welcome all of you. And um, yesterday we had a very nice talks about evolution, some evolution of bacteria, uh, resistance uh, in TB, mycobacterium TB, mycobacterium tuberculosis resistant, and uh, some different mechanisms, some, some different approach against uh, resistance. Very nice talk. And uh, if you see, very good. If you don't see, you can back there to the YouTube and see all the, the talks that was very, very nice. And today we have a very uh, other, other, other talks, very interesting. And the continue with this <laughs> morning about the emergence of drug resistance because mycobacterium tuberculosis has become a global concern about the resistance of these strains. And the genes um, continue to afflict, afflict TB control. So TB control, it's important to the treatment or identify the patient uh, complete treatment, but also is necessary uh, have a um, uh, carry look in the drug resistant mycobacterium tuberculosis. And uh, today we have uh, a talk mm -hmm. uh, with Dr. Pedro Eduardo Almeida da Silva. Dr. Pedro. It's a full professional in medical microbiology at Faculty of Medicine, Rio Grande, in Rio Grande do Sul. He's graduated in pharmacy and in biochemistry, master in science, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, doctor in medicine and molecular microbiology, by the University of Zaragoza, postdoc post at the Institute of Tropical Medicine, Antwerp, Belgium. He was a, a visiting professor at the University of Central Florida and also at the University of Zaragoza. And uh, <laughs> now is a coordinator of the diagnostic area of uh, Head TB in Brazil. Um, <clears throat> he has uh, studied development of a new antimicrobial and the flux mechanism inhibitors, evolution of uh, antimicrobial resistance, <clears throat> TB genotype. So, uh, um, Professor Pedro has, uh, has a very um, uh, uh, strong skill in many areas of TB and the other mycobacteria. So I give you now the Dr. Pedro, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Saad. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and uh, it's an uh, honor, in fact. Um, it's, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, present the, a short uh, slides about antibiotic resistance in mycobacterium tuberculosis. This amazing uh, title, uh, The Darker Side of Tuberculosis, in fact, is true. Uh, 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 unfortunately, it's true. Uh, so, the next, the next slide is uh, the first. I would like to present the global picture of tuberculosis today. I'm going to okay. I try to. 
to visual here. Okay, uh, can you see this this uh, figure? Uh, the the last year, uh, WHO uh, detected uh, around uh, seven point five millions of cases of new cases of TB. Uh, the not five cases is uh, thirty percent minus of the estimated cases uh, that uh, about uh, ten point six million new cases. So we have a thirty percent minus. Uh, related to to this, uh, we had one point three million uh, new deaths uh, related to TB. This is two bits for a uh, few minutes. It's, it's uh, uh, very, very impressive. Uh, what is the, the main risk factors to development of, of uh, TB? And then the smoking, alcohol, uh, co-infection, HIV, and the diabetes, it's, it's the main factor risks, but these risks is, is related uh, mainly uh, the poverty and the, the misery of the people. Uh, drug resistant tuberculosis is the darker side of TB. It's the worse uh, view of TB. Uh, in, in 1944, the streptomycin uh, was discovered by by a, a Waxman and the Schwartz uh, in in Pennsylvania in Rutger University. It is this discovery changed the the vision, the perspective, and the, of of the TB, a radical perspective of TB. In fact, this this time was the gold time of the discovery of, uh, of uh, antibiotics. However, in 1948, uh, Crofton and Dimitson published uh, one paper that uh, uh, they showed the streptomycin resistant in pulmonary tuberculosis in patients that received uh, streptomycin alone. Today is uh, the <clears throat> MDR cases and uh, rifampicin resistant cases uh, declines in proportion of people with TB uh, uh, in uh, 2015 and 2022. Uh, can you see this, this two uh, figure? The first figure, uh, uh, people with no previous history of TB treatment, uh, around three uh, three percent of 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 uh, total cases of TB, uh, while uh, people previous treated of, uh, for TB around uh, twenty percent in in medium in the last last years. Of course, the people previous treated for TB is more prevalent cases uh, with uh, TB drug resistance. Uh, however, as uh, the quiz is, is it's not enough because it estimate number of people development, uh, developing uh, drug resistant TB, especially in the RTB and the rifampicin resistant TB is uh, relatively stable uh, in the last two, three years, but this, the number is very impressive. Around uh, four and five hundred uh, thousand cases, new cases estimated for year, per year. Uh, so uh, nearly uh, five hundred thousand uh, cases of uh, MDRTB in 2020. Uh, this this case one in four was uh, diagnosis. Uh, one in five was treated, and just half of those starting treatment occurred. Is 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 very very serious situation uh, for uh, TB drug resistance. 
So it's important, very important to find the cases uh, fast, accurate, to cure cases fast, accurate, fast uh, uh, as possible, and uh, prevent cases more, more important. Uh, the situation uh, TB drug resisting in Brazil in the last years, uh, in fact, uh, we don't know what this this real situation in Brazil because is uh, uh, the surveillance of drug resisting tuberculosis is very 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 uh, 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 fragile of 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 approach. Uh, in this uh, around uh, 1,000 cases uh, was notified in the last years, but it's, uh, in fact, we don't know uh, what the number, the correct number or the, 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 the near correct uh, number. So it's, it's estimated around 50% uh, was detected and just 30% we started threatening. So we have uh, 55% missing cases and around 70% uh, no threat in Brazil. More, more serious is, is this, this picture uh, uh, of the time of, of a site TB, uh, the, the, the government site, uh, and this, this, this uh, figure was courtesy of the, the Dr. Fernando da Corno, as uh, that uh, working in in surveillance, uh, secretary of, of uh, health minister, and this this figure is, is important because uh, it shows uh, the the inverse of uh, primary and acquired resistance in, in, in tuberculosis. It is is very grave because it's, it's, uh, the the acquired resistance is is more prevalent in, in worldwide. In Brazil, it's not true. In Brazil, it's primary uh, drug resistant is is more prevalent in the in the, the next in the, the last years. It is uh, show that is the the the, the uh, of course the fail of of the the system uh, the surveillance of of drug resistant in TB. But uh, uh, for the more 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 uh, near my my expertise, how does Mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, become resistant to antimicrobials? In fact, the bacteria in general uh, have a, a few mechanisms to 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 resist uh, to antimicrobials, uh, like uh, enzymes uh, degrade for for antibiotics and um, decrease. Uh, uh, entry of antibiotics in, in bacterial cells, uh, mutation of of uh, target uh, of uh, 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 antibiotics, and uh, another uh, like uh, mechanisms, more general mechanisms like efflux. And uh, I, I I think that is in in two thousand twenty. Uh, WHO uh, published the category of mutation in mycobacterium tuberculosis complex and their association with drug resistance. Uh, of course, the canonical uh, mutation was, was shown is more prevalent and the mutation in genes uh, like RPOB for rifampicin, KTG, ENHA for isoniazid, PNCA for uh, pyrazinamid, uh, MD for etambutol, and ATP uh, for a uh, more uh, new drug of bedaquiline. Uh, this, this, these genes and uh, this, this mutation in these genes uh, related is, are related uh, in a high level of antimicrobial resistance in general. Uh, in this this figure, uh, uh, can you see um, uh, in, in red the the SNPs and the mutation uh, in general mutation SNPs of the election related with this uh, uh, resistant and in green in, in, in green no related and in in Greece 
uh, it is uh, in certain significance. So it's, it's, it's a very good uh, work, a very good study, because it's used a lot of, of uh, strains and worldwide uh, origin. So in this in this reduction uh, view, the drug resistant, the clinical drug resistant, the phenotypic uh, drug resistant is related just to mutations like SNPs, selection, insertions, uh, and our, and this 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 vision uh, think about a mutation in in, in uniform uh, microbial population. In fact, it's, it's not true. Uh, the the microbial population is very diverse uh, uh, population. It's no uniform population. But uh, other mechanisms to drug resistant uh, to drug resistant in, in mycobacterial tuberculosis, I I uh, would like to show a, a few slides about efflux mechanism. Uh, efflux mechanism is, is basically extrusion of a compound inside outside uh, of uh, bacteria cells. Can you see in this in this uh, figure uh, here uh, left uh, for me left, huh? and um, this 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 extrusion is uh, uh, occurred by by uh, transporter like like uh, uh, proteins of of transporters the several uh, families uh, major facilitator superfamily ABC TP family. And uh, it, this this uh, modeling of of uh, one uh, flux pump uh, here is is uh, uh, the pump the, the transporter and inside the several substrates uh, 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 transported uh, by this this uh, protein. The the first the first study about. Uh, a flux pump related uh, drug resistant in, in bacteria uh, was did uh, uh, in, in 1908 uh, and it published uh, by by McMurray, uh, Petrucci and the, and the Stuart Levy. Stuart Levy was the pioneer of a study uh, uh, with the related efflux uh, and and the resistant in this case was showed uh, resistant to tetracycline in, in, in E. coli, E. coli. And uh, the, 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 great, the, great, the big question about the flux was always uh, that a flux in general is related just with the low level of, uh, of antimicrobial resistance. In fact, this is not true. Uh, sometimes the flux is related with a high level of, of the antimicrobial resistance, but if, in fact, in most cases, in general, is related with the low level of antimicrobial resistance. The next question is, uh, low level antimicrobial resistance is important or not important? I, 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 would like to to show this 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 figure uh, proposed by by Julian Davis, the the honor uh, microbiologist, and uh, Julian Davis uh, get this this uh, theory uh, in toxicology, and this uh, the, the, he proposed the Ormes uh, phenomenon in, in, in treatment with the antimicrobial. So uh, we have the, the concentration that the bacteria bacteria static uh, effect in population of, of bacteria, but uh, uh, there is a zone of low level of concentration that uh, the transcript modulation is, is very diverse in the end uh, improve expression of of a transcription to several in, for several genes uh, and uh, some genes 
related to inspection of, of efflux path. Uh, it is the, the, the proposal of Julian Davis. Uh, what happened here is uh, increase the expression of, of uh, several genes among their uh, influx pump genes and the regulatory expression genes. And so uh, the, the next proposal, I, I, I get the, the same figure of iceberg. Uh, so, in, in the opinion of, of a several microbiologists, antimicrobial resistance is, is, is not a one or two, yeah, red or blue. Uh, it is, in fact, is evolutionary process. So, we have mutation that determine a phenotypic and the drug resistant, high level resistant, uh, maybe, but before we have a situation that decrease the concentration, decrease, decrease the concentration of antimicrobial, like a, a flux over expression genes, for example. And the, this situation determines low level of drug resistance and determine the scenery of the tolerance of antimicrobials and the, this allow mutations of uh, determined uh, phenotypic drug resistance. This, this, uh, uh, the panorama more, 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 more uh, evolutionary uh, vision. Uh, the first evidence of uh, drug flux mechanisms in mycobacterium and tuberculosis. The first uh, study published was did by Takif and the collaborators that uh, show the efflux pump that in mycobacteria making matches, no bacteria, no mycobacteria tuberculosis, uh, related to fluoroquinolone resistance. In fact, this, this pump uh, is, is studied by, by uh, Takifi group, uh, is not similar uh, in, in genome, uh, uh, don't uh, find similar in genome of mycobacterium tuberculosis, but it's, it's, it's a pioneer uh, study, it's, it's a similar uh, paper, it's very important because the first paper that they showed the resistance uh, related to flux in, in, in general mycobacteria. In 1998, uh, AINSA in Saragossa in group de Carlos Martin that uh, uh, talk uh, tomorrow, uh, show had uh, the efflux in, in, in presenting mycobacterium fortuitum and mycobacterium tuberculosis. This uh, AINSA uh, uh, characterized uh, of the TAP, uh, the famous uh, RV. Um, 1258 uh, related resistance to tetracycline and amino uh, 2001, uh, uh, we show that uh, another uh, pump, P55, uh, related uh, resistance in mycobacterium bobs and mycobacterium tuberculosis to amino glycoside. Um, uh, uh, after um, years uh, was uh, showed that is this the same uh, pump is related with the fitness of mycobacterium tuberculosis too. 2002 we we show about uh, several uh, pumps of uh, uh, major facilitated superfamily related uh, uh, drug resistant in mycobacterium tuberculosis. So uh, this the, the catalog that the, uh, I showed before uh, also um, point of of mutation in in, in genes uh, that coded uh, a flux pump relate uh, uh, resistant to isoniazid. A flux uh, in a flux of a drug in mycobacterium tuberculosis today is uh, have uh, 600 published uh, paper, uh, and uh, this paper uh, it's uh, the the approach, uh, the main approach 
this this paper uh, for uh, show uh, the flux uh, and the uh, related flux and the uh, resistant antimicrobial is increase antimicrobial resistance by overexpression of a uh, flux or regulon. Uh, for example, much copies plus medium with the flux pump genes cloned. Uh, increase the antimicrobial susceptibility by knockout of pump genes and the accumulation of uh, substrates by a flux inhibition action. Uh, accumulation by chidobramide, uh, uh, tetracycline with uh, tritium, and another tech approach, and the decrease of antimicrobial resisting presence of efflux uh, inhibitor. Uh, but uh, um, for <laughs> for a long time, uh, in, uh, I think that is uh, twenty years, twenty five years. Uh, microbacterial flux was just supporting just uh, evidence in, in experiments, in the basic experiments, but uh, uh, never uh, was until this this uh, until 2014 who was demonstrated uh, related uh, resistant in clinical strains. So uh, one time, one day, microbacterial flux uh, passed uh, from supporting to best actor. Uh, Andrews uh, uh, working Jensen yes. Jensen. Uh, hello. Hello. It's, it's, it's okay? Everything okay, uh, Pedro? Ah, okay. Go ahead, no problem. I, I'm sorry. Was a problem here. Okay. Go ahead. And okay, thank you. And uh, uh, so, 2014, uh, Andrews, uh, working in Jensen, uh, discovered that the uh, high level of of uh, drug resistant to by uh, uh, was related to mutation in, in a TPE gene and the Pipki uh, mutation gene, but uh, low level of of resistant uh, was related uh, mutation in repressor uh, transcriptional uh, pump. Uh, MMPS5, MMPL5. So uh, the, the first time that was showed uh, the related with uh, drug resistant in microbacterial uh, tuberculosis strains, clinical isolates, and in this case for the new drug, the first new drug after uh, 40 years uh, uh, waiting for a uh, new drugs. And the more, in this case, the overexpression, this pump, determine resistant, uh, low level, of course, to be daclino resistant, but clofazamine resistant uh, too. Uh, so it's the first time overexpression flux system with mycobacterium tuberculosis determine resistant, and in this case, multiple drug resistance. So uh, I would like to show this this uh, phrase of his uh, Carl Sagan that uh, the absence uh, of evidence is not the evidence of absence. It's important uh, when uh, you uh, make science, basic science. Uh, so. If uh, if flux if flux is is very important to drug resistant, it is uh, uh, an opportunity to to search uh, compounds that inhibit the flux. Of course, uh, in 2020, in, in a big review uh, about the uh, alternative to to antimicrobial uh, antibacterial uh, pipeline. Uh, was proposed uh, potentiator of of uh, action antimicrobial action uh, among this potentiator was inhibition of the flux uh, as a new strategy against infect uh, infection disease. Uh, 
Uh, our group in, in 2021 uh, showed the uh, tetra uh, hydropyridine that uh, uh, show a good good uh, performance in, in laboratory tests, increase the effect of antimicrobial. In this example, reduce uh, uh, 16 times the MAC to rifampicin, uh, one strain resistant to a high level of resistance, decrease resistance uh, 60 times. Of course, this, uh, this, this strain, uh, uh, the, the, this strain uh, continued the drug resistance, from single resistance, because in this case, um, uh, there was association to mechanisms uh, of, of uh, drug resistance, mutation in RPOB gene, and e, uh, overexpression in flux. It is important to say here that sometimes the, the level of resistance is the uh, synergy effect of uh, two or more mechanisms of resistance in microbacteria too. And uh, so this is another experiment with use the traditional verapamil, uh, the classical inhibitor of, of uh, flux, and the, uh, our uh, heat uh, compound, NUN2, and the, uh, the, the new compounds show uh, more uh, effective accumulation in MDR strains, uh, more effective than verapamil, and the furthermore, this, this uh, uh, compound uh, show uh, bactericid activity in log phase. So the compound have a two uh, action, inhibit of efflux pump and act uh, uh, antimicrobial per se. Okay, uh, what is necessary to control TBDR in the old eyes in Brazil, etc.? The first, of course, is, is control of uh, poverty and the misery of the people because tuberculosis is, uh, tuberculosis is a disease uh, related, strongly related to poverty and misery. The, another point is improve of the diagnostic approach. Uh, regarding laboratory diagnostics, it's necessary in new platforms uh, should be fast obtained of results and uh, uh, present low cost uh, to be uh, accurate, easy execution, and to detect TB and the TB drug resistance. Essay should detect at least isoniazid and rifampicin resistance. In Brazil, we use uh, 200 machines in nowadays to determine uh, to determine uh, if it be or not be, and uh, drug resistance to rifampicin. It's not enough for control uh, drug resistance. It's necessary. It's urgently necessary to detect isoniazid resistance also, because isoniazid is more prevalent than rifampicin resistance, the first. The second, the rifampicin resistance is uh, not always is the same MDR resistance. Sometimes rifampicin is more resistant than rifampicin. It's no MDR resistance. Uh, I would like to highlight in this, uh, this slide the implementation of the rapid and the accurate test is not a guarantee of a quick treatment implementation. It's uh, the, the situation is more complex. It's necessary uh, a, a robust strategy to, to, to uh, uh, connect the the rapid and the accurate test with the rapid uh, in tratamento implementation. And another uh, approach is improve of the treatment. New antimicrobials and the new combinations of antimicrobials and new strategies 
terapêutica estratégica necessária and the, and the, in, in the, this moment uh, is, is a test a, a, a three or, or four uh, new combinations and strategy. Uh, it's necessary development and implementation advanced like in reflex reflux pump, of course. Uh, um, if, if, if reflux is important mechanism to determine uh, drug resistance, it's important to, to search uh, compounds that uh, can inhibit this, this, this mechanism. Uh, unfortunately, I showed the say that uh, uh, don't have uh, any inhibitor reflux pump used for uh, adjuvant antimicrobial or uh, adjuvant for uh, anti-tumoral uh, therapy today. It's very, so it's very, very uh, mission to, to find this, this compound. Uh, another point is development of, uh, of a new pharmaceutical formats. It's important, like in nanocarriers, for example, to improve the treatment in child. It's important to highlight uh, also in, in this slide, no new antimicrobial or adjuvant antimicrobial or uh, pharmaceutical formats will be good enough if the treatment is not started quickly and completed. So it's necessary to complete the treatment for months, six months, but it's necessary support, social support sometimes to complete the treatment. So a uh, public politic for, for a TB is uh, uh, then important uh, uh, technology, high technology to uh, diagnose and to do treatment. It's important also, of course, increase the surveillance of, of a resistant. Uh, in this case, use a phenotype and molecular approach to detect the drug resistant. It's important comparison between a phenotype and the molecular drug suitability test detect different mechanisms of drug resistance. It's improved epidemiology surveillance of uh, drug resistance, monitoring drug resistance to old and new drugs, especially new drugs, using sequence to detect prevalence basis of uh, drug resistance and to find the molecular basis to resist for new antimicrobials. We evaluate genetic diversity among the circulant strains in Brazil and the America. Uh, my highlight of this relation, uh, this this slide is uh, more more serious. Uh, we would like to say that uh, we are using new drugs like pedaclin and delamanid and pretomanid without a robust surveillance of drug resistance. We are still underestimating the power of the dark side. Last but not least, I would like to show the next and the last two. Pedro, slides. sorry to interrupt you, but it's we've gone past 30 minutes now. If it's possible okay. to conclude okay. in the next few minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to a few minutes. Uh, just uh, to, to show this impact uh, in drug resistant TB of a new vaccine is mathematical modeling in using a new vaccine in 2027, in reduction uh, drug resistant in TB in China, around 70% uh, 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 in, in, in people uh, without infection and 30% uh, in people who, uh, uh, without and with infection. Uh, another uh, mathematical model uh, is impacted drug resisting new vaccines, in, in general vaccines, but in tuberculosis is reduction around uh, uh, in low light, uh, 20, 23% of uh, uh, drug resistance. So uh, uh, finally, I would like to, to uh, uh, say that is uh, the, the phrase of uh, uh, the Manuel Bandeira, the, the poet uh, 
the Brazilian poeta, the role life that uh, could be uh, could have been and was not. In Portuguese, a vida inteira que podia ter sido e não foi. This is a, a part of pneumotoric poesy, uh, right uh, in uh, 1930, uh, when uh, we don't have uh, easy uh, and accurate diagnosis and we don't have uh, antimicrobials. Uh, it's time uh, to end the TV. It's my uh, group of, of research is, is uh, our uh, big, big research is very, very good uh, and robust uh, research group. Thank you very much. Uh, you are muted. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Predo, and uh, for your nice talk. And uh, let me see if there is any question. Uh, no question. So uh, I would like to, um, to ask you and seek. Um, uh, now, um, they are giving a priority to sequencing the target gene that code uh, for the, the resistance, okay? But you know that the sequence is not so good to detect uh, low resistance. And you are saying that if a fruit pump can do that, how you can see some possibility to put together these two uh, mechanisms or techniques to help uh, to identify resistance, mycobacterial tuberculosis? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Marilena. Uh, I I think that is uh, the sequence is, is very robust too uh, for uh, surveillance, uh, but it's necessary to 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 good to good questions. And uh, I I I I think that is the use of sequence in general sequence the whole sequence. It's necessary to surveillance, but. Uh, the, the epidemiologic question is important. Related to drug resistant uh, TB, I think that's the bold technique, the bold platform sequence and the phenotype test is, is it's necessary to use always. Uh, as you, you say, that is uh, the phenotype test detector resistant uh, independent of, of uh, the molecular basis, the genetic condition. Sometimes the resistance is overexpression, is, is no, 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 no canonic mutation uh, like uh, uh, RPOP or, or KGG. I think that is, is uh, the, the, the both approaches, it's uh, important to use in surveillance. But in diagnostic, I, I have uh, uh, more uh, prudence because the, the cost of, of the sequencing is, is uh, higher uh, in this moment. Well, it's true, but we have to use all the skill we have to uh, improve uh, detection of resistance. But I miss your talk about, um, about the other problem that uh, um, is a risk factor for resistance, abandon mm -hmm. of the treatment. It's yeah. a big problem. Yeah. So I would like to hear from you about this big problem. Yes, uh, I... I uh... Told that is, is, uh, uh, it's necessary to complete the treatment. Uh, so it's. it's uh, yes, it's necessary to complete the yeah, treatment. Yeah, but yeah. how to, to draw back 
the situation. You, uh, well, well, you are the guy to, to, to say social, that. Uh, no, so, so public social, uh, political public social support, because the, the abandono tratamento is, is uh, it's, uh, determined, uh, uh, easy, it's easy to see what the, the, the characteristic of the population that abandoned the tratamento. So the political specific to support social support these, these people, improve TDO, for example, or, or, or uh, support financial support, uh, uh, Bolsa Família, or it is it's necessary to improve the uh, the, uh, 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 the addition of, of uh, treatment. Actually, I think it's not enough. I think yeah. you have to see the patient in, in a holistic way. Because sometimes this patient that ab abandoned the treatment this patient has other uh, comorbidities that yeah. nobody look at that, All right? So uh, 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 both the family is, is nice, it's good, but the main thing about this patient that ab abandoned the treatment is his is abandon of his humanity. Because he has other pathologies that nobody sees. Yeah, okay? of course. So Some... I think we have to amplify uh, the actions to uh, manage this kind of uh, patients that ab abandon the treatment. All right. So I think it's very important to 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 have a more holistic um, uh, view. Okay. So. Okay, I agree. I agree. But this, it's it's in fact occur which co-infect HIV patients that the abandon is 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 minors of of uh, another uh, co-infection, uh, another comorbids like in, uh, diabetes, for example. Because no, there the, is the, other uh, the, the drug addict. The there is a the, problem of uh, mental problems. Um, recently, we did a work with uh, resist resistant uh, uh, cases in Rio de Janeiro. And the main uh, risk factors, uh, significant, was just that comorbidities. Yeah, different the, comorbidities. The, okay. The, the the situation is and, very And uh, of course the poor socioeconomic uh, situation, Yeah. right? The so the situation. I, I think um, we have time, uh, Tiago. Tiago? Deca, we still have time? No, actually we were um, 15 minutes over time. Oh, come on. Oh. Thank you very much, Pedro. So- uh, Thank you very much. Now I would like to introduce uh, Leonardo Silva de Araújo uh, that is going to talk about the resistance of, but I think completely a little, a little bit what uh, um, uh, Dr. Pedro uh, talked about. And uh, in another way, uh, look at the uh, molecular, to the molecular area. Uh, Leonardo Silva de Araújo began his scientific career in, as a trainee in our cellular microbiology laboratory in uh, Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. He graduated, he's graduated by the State University of Rio de Janeiro. He did his master degree and the PhD in, our, uh, in Oswaldo Cruz Foundation also in our lab. And um, he has uh, uh, since then uh, developed expertise in studying immunological and transcriptional, transcriptional biomarkers to identify latent mycobacterium uh, infection and to monitor progression to active TB. 
He worked as a visiting researcher at Twin Core in Hanover, Germany, and currently has a position at the Laboratory of Molecular and Experimental Micro Microbacteriology at the Research Center Postel, Germany. He is a, a, project, a project coordinator to implement next generation sequencing to identify resistance in countries with a high burden drug resistant to be. Mm -hmm. And which process he will share with you today. So it's a, 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 a very important thing. It's a new um, approach to fight drug resistance to be blood world, worldwide. And so please, Dr. Leonardo, you can start. Thank you, Maria Elena. It's a great pleasure to be here. Also, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation and for sending the kind of reminders. I hope I sent everything that was needed for this presentation. So, yeah, as Marilena said, so I'm a project coordinator and I'm the implementation of sequencing technology to help fight tuberculosis and other blood pathogens in low resource settings. And today I'm going to show a little bit of this work. Uh, we have other countries um, in this project, but um, I'm going to show mainly today about the implementation process in Namibia. So it's going for in a place that has known or almost no capacity to do NGS to a place that's able to do NGS to predict the resistance in tuberculosis. So I'm having trouble. Oh, okay, I could share um, change the slide. I hope you can see also the pointer. So Namibia is a high TB and high TB HIV country. Uh, it's located in sub-Saharan Africa, but it's considered as a, a upper middle income country. There is a big gap in the um, diagnostic of all cases of tuberculosis, as we can see here from the latest reports from WHO. And this gap is proportionally higher when we talk about drug-resistant tuberculosis. So among the people that's predicted to have per year, they only detect um, less than half of it. And it's still, even though the detected ones, they don't have a full profiling of the drugs that this bug is resistant against, they already start treatment, for example, with new short uh, treatment regimens that are recommended by WHO. Uh, in here, these 158 patients, they were treated with the BPAO or BPAO-M um, um, regimen, even though they were not tested for resistance to these drugs. So it's important to strengthen the, the detection of uh, resistance uh, in this country. Um, in this um, slide here, we can look here in the flow chart, and I'm showing uh, different pipelines for detection of resistance to tuberculosis. So we can see uh, the colors green, yellow, and red they represent how fast uh, this test is. So we have fast tests like the GeneXpert RIF or the GeneXpert XDR. And inside the, the, the figure, we have the drugs that are being tested for. So this is the current uh, pipeline for drug resistance testing. And we can see it can take from one day with the GeneXpert to up to six weeks or more because we have to wait for the culture to grow and then do phenotypic DST or phenotypic drug susceptibility testing. Uh, if we have in the country the technology to do whole genome sequencing, we can do a complete genotypic drug resistance determination. And this is very helpful in the case of M, uh, M tuberculosis. Um, uh, but we have to, still to wait for the culture to grow, and then that's why this is red here. So either phenotypic or whole genome sequencing, it needs some time. Here, it needs a bit less of time, and also there is less risks than using the BSL-3 to do the culture for all these drugs. So still whole genome sequencing can give some advantage here, also in terms of maintaining a BSL-3. And I'm going to talk later in this presentation that also in some settings, you don't have a BSL-3 lab. Yeah. 
Uh, and if we have the capacity to do TNGS, so targeted next generation sequencing, uh, we can reduce a lot the turnaround time. So for, for uh, six weeks to 1.5 days to eight days. Yeah. And uh, in the panel here, we can see all the drugs that can be tested using the target sequence. For example, the Dplex uh, kit from Genus Screen. This is how long it takes, uh, less than 48 hours to three days. And we can test for um, first line, second line, new drugs, and also for uh, species identification. In this flow chart here to, the, to my right, you can see again, all the tests that are available in the country. So LPAs, uh, phenotypic DST, gene expert RIF and XDR, and target NGS. And you can see that um, all the drugs that are, all the resistance that are tested by the other tests can also be tested by targeted sequencing. Yeah, of course, there's still some drugs that are not tested by any of these tests. And when we talk about the new regimens for drug resistance uh, treatment, we have the inclusion here of bedaculin and linezolid that are not tested, that were not tested in the country. And uh, pretiomanid is still out, but um, we already know that the new version of these kits for target NGS will have uh, not only more targets for bedaculin, but also pretiomanid. Okay, uh, yeah, this project, it, we need the funds to implement, to develop the capacity for, for NGS. And this was funded by the Minister of Health in Germany with a program called GHPP or Global Health Protection Program. And the first phase was from 2019 to 2022. I started to work in this project in 2020. And now we are in the second phase of the project that's from 23 to 25. Uh, in here, you can see the maps that we are doing current implementation or support implementation of uh, target NGS in the world. And the ones that are more, um, that are connected to this project are Mozambique here, Esvatin, this is a small uh, dot or island in South, South Africa, and uh, Namibia, that's this one here that we are talking about in this presentation. So even uh, recently, WHO released a, a press release that um, to promote the use or to, um, I forgot the word, but to, to promote the use of target NGS to detect drug resistance tuberculosis. Um, and we, even before that, we already started the implementation. So this, is, this was released in the uh, middle this year and we started in 2019. So the idea was to do it directly from Sputum. I'm, I'm having some background noise. I'll ask the colleagues to mute their microphones. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so directly from Sputum, uh, the DNA from the MTB is extracted using Genolyze. It's a kit that's normally used to do the LPA test. It's also a molecular test. And we used the leftovers of this uh, DNA extraction, clean up, do the duplex, uh, multiplex PCR, prepare the library and do the sequencing. And then we go to the cloud analysis. The, one of uh, the advantages also of this test uh, is that uh, we have a cloud platform to do the analysis. So it's very simple to analyze NGS data. We, we all know that Talking about NGS, people might be scared because it might be difficult to analyze, but in this case, it's not. And also I have uh, no conflict of interest, so I'm not being paid by this company to say anything about this kit. Uh, I'm just take, uh, talking about the advantages and how, why we choose it to be the kit that we use to implement in the countries. So yeah, and as I, I talked before, so we needed to do the Sputum, uh, generalized direct, directly from Sputum, but we had some problems with the BSL-3 in Amiga, so we had to actually start doing the extraction directly from culture, from an MG culture. Uh, this was in the first years, just to implement the technique and to train the personnel, but now we are already able to do it. Uh, we have a functional BSL-3, and it's we are able to do it directly from Sputum. 
I remember, I remember the word, so uh, WHO endorsed the use of um, target NGS for drug resistance in some specific cases. Yeah, this is the uh, roadmap that we used for the implementation. Uh, it is published, it was published this year, a couple of months ago. We have three main pillars, so preparation, implementation and sustainability. I don't want to go uh, through all these points for the sake of time, but mainly like you have to know uh, the, the needs of the country that we, you are implementing, you know the final use of the technique, so which kind of population will be, <clears throat> we make, uh, we have advantages with the use of this the technology. Coordination has to be um, up and running doing all the process and communication also is very important. Yeah, we have also in the second phase to establish the infrastructure and the data analysis uh, infrastructure. Uh, and this basically to build all the, to procure and to, to build all the lab that's doing NGS. Um, we also have to give trainings uh, and also to train the trainers so that people there are also passing the knowledge. So it also contributes with the uh, increase of knowledge or development of technology in the country. Um, and of course, we have to think about how we utilize the data. So is the data that's generated only be used only for research? Should we use it for um, clinical management? So what are we going to use the data of this for? In Namibia, we are still at research level. We had some special cases, special patients that needed to, to, be, uh, to have the sample sequenced in order to have a proper treatment because there were some failures patients, but very rare. But in other settings like in Eswatini, we are already going to the clinical phase. So the results are actually being uh, utilized by uh, the, the doctors to uh, change or to dr drive the regimen that's given to the patient. And also uh, we have to think in the long term when we go from implementation to sustainability. So we have to scale up, it means running more samples and running also uh, other diseases, samples that you want to test for other diseases. Uh, we have also to identify additional funding sources because this has to be continued running in the countries after the project is ended and also to anchor NGS into the national budget. So money from their ministries would go, would be reserved for uh, this technique. And for this, um, the endorsement from WHO is, was very important. And we, we got short communication mid, middle this year and uh, WHO promised a full communication by beginning of next year, endorsing the use of the NGS or targeted NGS. So this is a picture of the lab. So um, these are the sequencers. This is the ISIC 100. It's a very user-friendly machine, and you have the screen already attached to it. Um, this is an old Sanger sequencing, so we use it. Um, we we build our capacity not from zero, so the, the the staff in the country already had some knowledge in molecular biology, and this is the computer for the analysis and some uh, data storage for also having a backup. The personnel was trained to use the technology and to analyze the data. And in the right side here, we have this pie chart showing the average distribution of costs during these four years of implementation. So it's very important to have in this project's costs for personnel. So we have a lot of um, projects, similar projects that only fund consumables and, and hardware, so consumables and a sequencer, and then who's going to do the sequencing in the country. So it's important to think about personnel also, uh, consumables and traveling for trainings and the devices were uh, also um, included in this project. Uh, in this slide here, I'm showing the initial uh, cost or the initial investment for the implementation in Namibia. In the table here, we see the cost for consumables, 
it seems a bit high, but this is the initial consumer. So for example, some chemicals for DNA extraction, we have to buy then like one liter and you only need one or two microliter per sample. So it's going to last forever, but we had to include them in the initial budget. And we have materials, plasticware, consumables for general use in the lab, DNA extraction, for the amplification, for library preparation, NGS, and also shipment. And Namibia is a country for a small population, so they don't have the development of the, the commerce for um, bioproducts is not so developed. So either we procure here in Germany and ship to them, or we procure in South Africa. Either way, we have to ship. So there are costs here for shipment. And of course, yeah, should not be like that, but it's always cheaper to procure in Germany than in South Africa. We have an important difference here. So this was the initial one for the establishment of the, the capacity. Uh, on the right side here, we have the, the hardware, so computers, the camel cycle, PCR oxidation freezers, and um, the sequencers itself, and the, uh, and the total costs. After all of this, so we had trainings, and then uh, we had pilot study to, to show that if it was working, to check on that. We have in this uh, in the pilot study that was published here a total of 48 rifampicin resistant samples that were um, included. They were detected by gene expert. Still, uh, sequencing is an expensive technique, so it's not recommended to be used as a screening test. Maybe, I don't know, in 10 years or 15 years, we can have it if the price is reduced and technology advances. We can have it as a screening test, but so far it's good to have a pre-screening test to select a sub subgroups that will be tested for sequencing. And this table here, it's one output of the Diplex cloud. So that uh, cloud platform that I showed to you, that's part, when you buy the kit, you can use the, the this, um, this cloud platform to do the analysis. And this is an Excel, um, and that a table that you can export from it. You have, uh, for example, sequencing results, acceptability, and all the information about coverage that are important to have. And very interesting to see, uh, I'm not sure if for all the 48 samples, but just for a subset of them, how diverse we can see here. So in red, we have the resistance. So it's a marker for resistance. So for example, this sample here is resistant to rifampicin, isoniazid, etambutol, and etionamide. And in blue, is it depicts when we have a mutation that is not um, described to be linked to resistance. So it just say that it's different from the standard um, uh, sequence, the standard strain, but we don't know if this can uh, give resistance or not to that drug. Yeah. And the, the light color, also not important point here is that we have resolution to see subpopulations. So sometimes for some samples, you have two different strains in the same patient. And also we have some resolution for that using targeted NGS. And here, these light colors means that in a subpopulation, a smaller population or in, in this sample, we have some mutations in the gene that uh, for uh, that can give uh, resistance to linezolid, but this mutation is not associated with resistance in any catalog because it's blue. Yeah, I hope this was clear. In, in gray here, we have um, the ones that were not um, completely covered during sequencing, so the sequencing could be improved. It can be for any reasons, like for example, the quality of the DNA or some technical problems. So in these ones, we could not um, have information if it's resistant, resistant or not. Um, yes, and in here, again, this, this um, orange, it's just a light red. So it means that in a subpopulation in this sample, we have some um, resist some mutation that gives resistance to rifampicin. So not that it's ethyl resistant strain or, or ethyl resistant sample. So with two or more strains. Yeah.
And in, in also in this publication, we, uh, together with the Minister of Health in Namibia, some colleagues from the Minister of Health, we developed a possible workflow how we could incorporate TNGS in their algorithm. So, of course, starting with a cheaper and faster uh, screening test, that's the gene expert with Ultra. And if resistance is detected to rifampicin, then this sputum would be sub the second sput would be submitted to target NGS. Yeah, of course, not excluding the phenotypic DST. And uh, in this case, also, um, this, the counters are also implementing the new um, MTB XDR gene expert that has more um, targets. And also, if any resistance is detected to any target here, so another sample would be submitted to the contamination and then target NGS. Yeah. Um, this is one of my last slides. I think I have only one more. This is a SWOT analysis, so strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And I'm highlighting for, for the use of, of TNGS for drug resistance prediction in tuberculosis. I'm highlighting the ones I find interesting. So TNGS or NGS technology itself, it's multipurpose and multi-disease. So this technology can be used for several uh, diseases, for example, HIV drug resistance prediction, malaria, and also for COVID um, um, typing. For example, during the pandemic, so as you see in the timeline, as you see in the timeline, the project was started before the pandemic a little bit and then continued after. We have we had to shift the use of these machines of the sequencers and actually do um, COVID uh, sequencing. I'm sorry, Leonardo. Yes, uh, I, I, I can finish. Ten minutes, please. <laughs> Could you okay. finish your talk? Yes, yes, I know yes. your last slide, but please make it, make it, make short. Thank you very okay. much. Yes, so yeah, strengths also it's suitable for various sample types. So sputum or um, stool, for example, it's wrapped, so faster turnaround times than phenotypic DST as weaknesses. So turnaround time depends on referral and sample referral and sequencing capacity or multiplexing. It's not feasible at peripheral level. There is a lot of problems with supply chains, mainly in low-income countries, and, and need specialized and trained personnel. As opportunities, doing less phenotypic in the routine testing is very good. Interrogate resistance traditional antimicrobials, not routinely tested in national algorithms, as I showed in the beginning, and also the research outcomes. And as threat, so uh, uh, confi sorry, confidence grading of mutations requires large and representative data sets. We need support to clinicians, so clinicians need to know what's NGS and how to use this data and the limitations mostly. Uh, we have to demonstrate cost effectiveness. Um, we need efficient and timely results. And also very important is achieve sustainability. Uh, with this, I'll skip this slide and just want to thank my research group here in Germany and also our consortium. So here we have representatives from all the countries. So we have six countries that are partners in this consortium for the implementation of TNGS. And yeah, thank the audience for listening and I'm open to questions, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk, Dr. Leonardo. Um, we have some question here. Uh, Teca Galvão is asking you. I would like to ask you, you for, for drugs like etionamid. Few mutations have actually been confirmed to be associated with resistance. How could target energy S help with this? Yes, there are limitations and each drug um, has different sensitivity and specificity when we compare it to phenotypic DST. So there are some limitations, but still in terms of what it can bring and all the other drugs that usually we have a sensitivity and specificity higher than 90 or 95% compared to PDST. 
Yeah, but for other drugs like etanolamide, this is a bit more complicated. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Leonardo, but um, we are late, so I have mm -hmm. to make short the questions. And uh, so I give you the, your email in the, mm -hmm. in the chat. So everyone that needed to talk to you can write for your email. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. And, and now, Lucima. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome the next speaker, Dr. Alain Jefferson Guimarães. He is a full professor and researcher of the Mycology Laboratory in the Department of Microbiology and Parasitology at the Federal Fluminense University of Rio de Janeiro. Alain heads the Mycological Research Group that has contributed to study medical, biochemistry, and immunology with expertise in production and characterization of monoclonal antibodies, lectin antibody fusion proteins, and the chimeric proteins with vaccine and antimicrobial activity for use as potential therapies against fungal infections. The title of his talk is Development of immuno Immunobiologicals for the Therapy of Endemic Mycosis. Alan will, will the, the talk, Alan's talk will last 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll have five minutes open for questions. Okay, so can I share my screen now? Yeah, you can share your screen, please. Okay. And when you are ready, you can start, okay? Okay, just, just let me know if you can actually see the presentation now. Yeah. You're all able to see that? Okay. Okay. Perfect. So, <laughs> So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Lucimar and the organizing committee for the invitation to talk uh, on the uh, 7th in Simbab. It is always a pleasure to contribute to any, any event in Fiocruz because I actually started my, my career there. So today I, I decided to, to bring to you some of the latest results we've been getting uh, in our lab regarding the development of monobiologicals for the therapy of endemic mycosis. And we started actually this idea, this project about seven, eight years ago. I'm gonna be showing you some updates we have. And so just to give you a brief uh, background on mycosis and you know what's the scenario nowadays, uh, we actually, uh, now one thing that we can tell precisely is that we don't, know exactly the number of uh, mycosis cases worldwide. So we can extract some information from the literature and some countries, the information is available regarding the fungal burden and patients and all. But it's still, uh, the all the mycosis worldwide, they are under diagnosis. And from what we've been seeing is that, you know, we have a, a dramatic in increase in the number of cases lately. And specifically, when we talk about some uh, uh, severe mycosis, including uh, some of uh, those with allergic presentations, such as the aspergillosis, uh, some chronic severe mycosis, such as the, the histoplasmosis, and also paracoxiodo mycosis, and some acute uh, invasive mycosis as well, including cryptococcosis and candidiasis. And so, uh, What's actually you know uh, preoccupy us the most is uh, regarding like uh, you know the the underdiagnosis also is the uh, mortality rate of these infections, which is very high in all the cases, as you can see here in this graph. And so, uh, when we talk about the cohort of patients that are are actually predisposed to invasive fungal infections, we can tell uh, uh, some groups they can actually you know. Uh, get infected and develop disease, such as those uh, that live with HIV, neonates and elderly, uh, some patients that undergo surgical treatment, others in the intensive care unity. We 
being seen that a lot during the the COVID. Also, patients with cancer and undergoing chemotherapy with hematological malignance, those uh, undergoing immunosuppressive therapy, and also patients under uh, antimicrobial therapy, including antibiotics, because they eliminate the bacteria, but fungus, uh, they end up overgrowing you know, in the patient. So it is a very complicated scenario. And when we talk about the antifungal therapy to control these infections, in comparison with the antibiotics, we don't have many options. So basically, one of the drugs that we can use the echnocandins that target the cell wall, blocking the production of beta-1,3 glucan, which is a very important polysaccharide on the cell surface. Also, we have the amphotericin B, which is a polyene that actually binds to ergosterone, the cell membrane, making pores on the membrane, killing the fungus by that. We also have the azoles that actually block the biosynthesis pathway of ergosterol. And also those uh, other two drugs, as a flucytosin and, and the grisofulvin, that actually they act uh, in the nucleus, blocking the cell division. So basically, this is all the portfolio we have to treat fungal infections. But later on, we've been observing uh, a rise and increase in the resistance to these drugs. Uh, there's always the problem of the HIV pandemics and the emergence of, of new pathogens with intrinsic resistance, the multi resistant, or, and we have pathogens with no options to treat uh, whatsoever. And one of the main problems when we talk about the antifungal therapy is actually the toxicity and the severe side effects from these drugs. And so just to give you an example of the, the, what we've been facing so far, uh, these are some informations on those pergillus since the, the year of 2000. Uh, we've been observing that most of the isolates we've been uh, getting in, in clinics, they express resistance to azoles, for example. And we already know that this resistance actually comes from the, the usage of the azoles in the agriculture. The spurgillus get in contact with the drug there. The drugs uh, select the, the spurgillus, they become resistant. And when they infect the patients and the patients go to the doctor to start the treatment, we see a failure. So basically, this is one of the main problems. And uh, despite that, also, we see other uh, fungal uh, pathogens emerging from the environment, such as the Canada aurus, which is a huge problem nowadays. It was first detected in the year of 2008 in Japan. And... You know, a lot of uh, scientists being correlated the emergence of this bug to uh, global warming because the fungus changed this, its lipid profile and became resistant also to drugs. In the case of kinds of ours, for example, we see a, a multi-resistant profile in which the fungus is resistant to three or more class of antifungals. So we have this problem to deal with. So uh, we're urging for new therapies in the case of antifungals to treat this chronic uh, disease that, you know, they, they have high morbidity and mortality. So this has uh, actually driven the development of the immunotherapy. And we have two alternatives there, vaccines and passive immunization. Historically, they're not associated with the development of resistance, but we have one main problem here when we talk about the vaccines in uh, patients uh, that you know can actually get the mycosis. Most of these patients they are immunocompromised, so the vaccines would not work in this subject. And in this case, the best option would be the passive immunization with either immune serum, monoclonal antibodies. And in many models we've been testing in the lab and also in other groups worldwide, we see that they have demonstrated good efficacy in many models. So. Uh, indeed, the monoclonal antibodies that have been considered uh, the magic bullets to treat uh, these uh, resistant pathogens uh, nowadays. But it's, we, we still see uh, have one main problem regarding these uh, reagents, which is the cost for producing them. It's still uh, is a little high, so we've been trying to develop some. Uh, new technologies and methodologies to actually decrease the price of production of these reagents here. 
So what's actually the advantage of the monoclonal antibodies when we compare them to other drugs? Because they have many mechanisms of action. One of them is the neutralization of the, the pathogen's antigen. They can activate a complement cascade. They DCC as well. They can modulate the immune response to the pathogen in favor of the host. And we see that as new mechanism that they might have a direct effect on the fungal pathogen as well. So these five mechanisms together, they act at once at the same time. So that's how antibody work. And so also when we consider an antibody for the treatment of infectious disease, we look for cross-reactivity. Instead, in the case of the, the diagnosis, for example, we look for specificity, but for, for an antibody, for example, we look for a molecule that can actually target as many as strains of the one and the isolates as we can. And actually this has renewed the interest for, for the new alternatives uh, using the passive immunization. And we've been calling these reagents that can actually a single antibody recognize many strains and many pathogens as universal antibodies. So this is what we actually more interested in the lab. So what's you know, the, the, the advantages of these universal antibodies then? So simply, if we take a closer look here of what happens with a patient when it gets a, a fungal infection, person has symptoms, go to the doctor, I'm sorry, and the doctor collects the sample, submits in a lab, the, the lab uh, identifies the pathogen and the case is reported. And one of the main problems regarding the mycosis here is that this uh, identification of the pathogen might take months. And if we're able to use uh, one antibody that can actually target uh, many fungal species at once, we eliminate the need to identify the pathogen and then we can act, starting treating uh, this, this patient early on. So that's the main advantages of, of using these, these reagents. And many years ago, uh, some groups started describing this idea of using uh, 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 cross uh, reacting antigens. We can uh, uh, say that one of the most important is the beta glucans that we can find on the cell wall of many fungi, many proteins. Also, uh, we see melanin with a really nice potential of being a, 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 an antigen, histone like proteins, heat shock proteins, and also other surface proteins. But <clears throat> uh, Regarding the, the, the HSPs, which we, we see that being expressed in, in many in living cells, basically all living cells, uh, this whole study uh, started uh, about, uh, I would say, uh, 15 years ago. Um, when I started my PhD with Dr. Nosanti, we developed a panel of monoclonal antibodies against HSP-6 CL fistoplasma capsulatum. And they bound really nicely to, to the cell surface of histoplasma in which we can find this HSP-60 there. And when we use these antibodies to treat uh, animals upon a lethal infection, we could see that they were protective. This protection was correlated with a uh, decrease in the fungal burn in the lung of these animals and also reduction in inflammation. So we got a really nice results using these antibodies. And as this HSP-60 is shared with many uh, fungal species, we decided to use the same panel of monoclonal antibody against other fungi, including sporotrix and also Canada albicans and Cryptococcus neoformans. And in the case of Cryptococcus neoformans, we actually took a step ahead, and Cryptococcus in Canada, sorry, we took a, a step ahead and then we, we actually linked these monoclonal antibodies with radioisotopes to actually enhance the antifungal activity. And we obtained really nice results. And this panel of monoclonal antibody was also used against Paracoxiosis lutzi, demonstrating really nice protective results as well. So the theory works. So we use a single antibody that can target many molecules. And so uh, then this project actually with uh, the lactin FCs, the idea started, uh, as I said, in 2016. And if we take a look at the surface of, of uh, many uh, fungal species on the cell wall, here we can see a cartoon depicting many uh, models of the cell wall. And we're looking for shared antigens, right? Uh, 
one of the uh, the, the with the main uh, potential to be uh, an antigen, as we can see here, is the beta one three glucan here shown in, in in green. Also, we have the chitin that's located uh, closer to 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 the cell wall. And basically, all the fungal species they express these two polysaccharides, so they become a really nice uh, targets to be used in the case of cross uh, uh, reactivity antigens. But one of the main point is better one three glucans and chitins they poorly monogenic. Even if we fuse them with toxins and all to to try to get titers against these these antigens. They do not assimilate a, a really nice a humoral response. They all short-lived antibodies as they are T-cell independent antigens. So it's really hard to make monoclonal antibodies against them. So we came up with this alternative, an idea of using uh, lectins that are actually uh, natural proteins that can bind to polysaccharides. So to uh, recognize them, the beta one three glucan, we decided to use dactin. Dactin has been described as one of the innate immune receptors that recognize the beta one uh, one three glucan as a pump. And also the WGA, which is a wheat germ agglutinin, it binds naturally to NSC two glucosamine residues that actually compose the chitin oligomers on the fungal cell wall. So using these two lactins, we could recognize all the fungal cell walls there. And so the main idea was, is as we were interested in constructing antibodies, we know that it's actually the FC uh, uh, part region of the antibody that gives all the factor function of antibodies, such as uh, optimization, the ADCC, uh, induce the phagocytosis, it can actually control inflammation and complement activation. So our idea was here to construct then FC fusion proteins, lactin FC fusion proteins with the WGA FC fused to the FC part of the antibodies or the lactin, uh, uh, lactin fused to also the CH2, CH3 part of the, the FC regions. So then we will have molecules that with opsonin activity, they would use phagocytosis, activate a complement system, and also the oxidative burst of phagocytes. So if we compare then the lactin FC fusion proteins with antibody, we have actually some advantages, including the lower molecular weight, increase the serum half-life. We can change the FC regions to prolong the therapeutic activity and stability. And they really easy to purify as well as the antibodies are. So the FDA lately uh, just to demonstrate the importance of this idea, they have released many drugs that consist of this technology of fusing uh, basically uh, lactins and FCs, but they all against immune diseases. We don't see any molecule being used in the against infectious disease. So this is where actually all the idea came from. So I'm going to be showing you some results that we got with the WGAFC, which was the first paper we published in 2017. So we had to uh, right, uh, clone the WGAFC and the FC part in the cassette to express this protein uh, mammalian cells. Not going to get into details. And so this protein is expressed as an antibody in solution. When we use, actually, we run an SDS page under non-reducing uh, conditions, we can see that it has around 100 uh, kilodown uh, molecular weight uh, as opposed to the antibody, which is 150, so they're much smaller. And under reducing conditions, which actually separate the, the chains, we can see that a single chain has around 55 kilodown. So they're much smaller than the antibody, meaning that they can penetrate better in tissues. So we had to uh, characterize the binding of this molecule uh, against the, w the native w WGAFC just to demonstrate that we're binding really nicely. So we determined the, the dissociation constant for the WGAFC and comparing with the native WGA, we can see they fall within the same order of magnitude. So they bind the same way to chitin. Uh, they are able to aggregate chitin in solutions. We can see here the the chitin particles, they become larger. They bind actually to the cell wall of all the fungi we tested against. And as we can see here, we have uh, distinct profiles of binding against histoplasma capsulatum. They bind uh, uh, the profiles like a, a ring around the, the fungal cell. 
uh, this is a really nice pattern because uh, histoplasma actually has 11% chitin on the cell wall. Before Cryptococcus and Canada, we see a more discrete pattern of binding, and that had been already uh, described in the literature. Cryptococcus, we see like some dots on the cell surface where the chitin is exposed. And the same goes on for Canada and Saccharomyces cerevisus with one, was one of the controls we used. So uh, basically, uh, we can see that you know uh, this WGFC bound to all uh, fungi we tested against. So when we use these reagents in vitro in a simple incubation with the fungus during the growth following the CLSI uh, uh, antifungal protocols, suitability testing protocols, we can see that they're able to uh, actually block fungal growth and in a dose-dependent manner in all the cases here. But I just have to point out that they bind to this fungal surface, but they do not kill the fungus, right? And they just impair the growth of these cells. And in the case of Canada Alpica, is one of the, the observations we had is that uh, Canada Alpica's when, when it's colonizing tissues, it is in, in the yeast form, but it, when it's invading tissue in the, during the pathogenesis of, of the candidiasis, it can produce the germ tubes to, to invade these tissues, and our molecules could actually block this process here. And so we could see that a, a, a lower percentage of the uh, germ tubes being formed in the presence of the WJFC and also the length of these structures. So they block the pathogenesis of candida. So regarding the opsonin inactivities of these molecules, we pre-incubated them with all the fung fungi, then we gave them to macrophage. We could see that not the case, but Saccharomyces, they induced the phagocytosis of these cells. And that was also accompanied uh, with the killing of the fungus by macrophages, meaning that these molecules, they could actually enhance the antifungal activity of these cells. And, in all the cases, this uh, increase in antifungal activity was correlated with increasing the nitric oxide production, also superoxide levels, by these effector uh, phagocytes. So you might be asking also, what happens in vivo? So we tested the histoplasma capsularum model, which was one of that actually gave us the best results in vitro. So we could see after uh, it infected this animal with a lethal inoculum and giving the WJFC, we have a full protection of these animals. We could see uh, that this was actually correlated with uh, a decrease in the fungal burden in lung, spleen, and liver of these animals. We have also cytokine data. You could see that the WJFC uh, administration increased uh, interferon gamma and decreased CNF of uh, cytokines, which for mycosis actually is a good uh, profile. And um, we have also the resolution of the infection happening quicker. And when we did some uh, histopathology evaluations as well, we could see that in the, the animals that actually receive WGAFC, it looks like they never got the infection with histoplasma capsularum. The lungs, they were actually lighter, meaning that there was less inflammation, of course. And so we could see that and come up with the mechanism uh, uh, showing that in the presence of the WGFC, there is a innate immune mechanism activation and the clearance of the fungal infection ha happens much faster in comparison to the controls. So those are where the, the first results with the WGAFC. Also with the Dactin FC, I'm just going uh, faster here. Um, we see that we express this Dactin FC in two forms now. Uh, the double, the IgG2A and IgG2E forms of the, the with the FC fusions, they bound really nicely to uh, all the, the models we tested as well. We could see that even the, the uh, immunofluorescence results, they were actually they bound much better than the WGFC. In this case, they blocked the fungal growth in vitro in a dose-dependent dep fashion as well. We see that they also block the filamentation of candida uh, in vitro. And they also induced phagocytosis of histoplasma, cryptococcus, and uh, candida albicans in uh, peritoneal macrophage models. And this was also 
correlated with a really nice uh, fungal killing by these cells in the presence of this dactin FC uh, IG2A and to be in all the cases. So what happens in vitro then? Uh, in the model of histoplasma encapsularum, we could see that uh, the IgG2As, the dactin FC IgG2As, they they protected the animals, but not as good as the, the dactin one uh, FC IgG2B, in which we see a full, full protection. But in both cases, after 14 days, we see a really nice drop in the fungal loads in the lung, spleen, and liver of these animals. So the only distinction in terms of mechanism of these two versions of the dectin one uh, FC's proteins here is actually the levels of TNF that the D2Bs actually could actually induce lower levels of uh, TNF. That's why the animals responded better to the administration of this IgG2Bs versions. And in the case of Canada, we could see also that the IgG2Bs uh, fully protected the animals. And in three days, we could see that uh, here in liver, uh, there is a drop in the fungal load. Uh, they actually, they, they get sent out to the spleen, so most of the candle localized there. And upon seven days, we see a clearance of the, the, lung, the, the liver uh, upon administration of this fusion protein. So we got really nice results with them. So we came up with, with this mechanism, just explaining that in the absence of this dactin FC proteins, the fungus got recognized through the dactin FC. We have intracellular cascade. Uh, with the activation of the NF kappa B adapter, ending up with uh, the sec uh, secretion of pro inflammatory cytokines, right, including uh, uh, interferon gamma as well. But in the presence of the dactin 1 FC, so we have opsonization and the recognition through the FC receptors, then we activate additional mechanisms and activating, activating also the oxidative burst of the phagocytes. And just to give you like some like uh, uh, quick results here in the Aspergillus, we also got really nice results. But in the, the case of Aspergillus, the cell wall of this fungus uh, is a very complicated structure because in the, in the case of the conidia, we have melanin and broadlets actually covering this uh, better glucan and chitin. In the case of hyphae, we see the galactoman and, and the gags. But in our favor, when the person gets infected with the conidia, for example, it germinates and the cell wall breaks down a little bit, exposing the structures which we wanted to target, right? So using then the dactin, the WGFC now against aspergillus, we see that they bound really nicely to the fungus. As we can see here, we see a, a fluorescence increase by a flow cytometry and immunofluorescence Evaluations here, we can see the WGFC bound to the conidia uh, in uh, germinating conidia or conidia force, and the dactin one fc bound to the conidia and also to the hyphae. So you could see that during germination, both molecules, both versions, dactin one fc WGFC, they we have an increase in binding, meaning that there's more exposure of the the targets, right? They also block the germination of the aspergillus from uh, conidia to hyphae. And they also block the biofilm formation of this fungus. And in this case here, we did additional evaluation just showing that they also block, uh, uh, sorry, they also activate uh, the complement deposition. We can see here, we can identify the, the, the actually uh, the C3 proteins on the surface of the bug. So they also induced phagocytosis by uh, the fungus by macrophages, and they kill the fungus, they induce the killing of the fungus by these cells, and they also were protective in these in vivo models of aspergillus. Just want to point out, and in this case of this model here specifically, we have to uh, inject cyclophosphamide and cortisone in the animal, so they fully immunosuppressed, and we give the, the FC fusion proteins after the infection, and could, we could see here uh, protection. So we are evaluating now different doses to see if we can actually ameliorate, ameliorate uh, the the results here. So this protection was correlated with a drop in the lung CFUs. In the case of the administration of the lactin FC fusion proteins, we see no dissemination of the fungus to the brain whatsoever. So as a concluding remarks, I just want to finish just by saying that all the, the, the lactin FC fusion proteins, we uh, 
and decided to make, they have high affinity to our fungal models. They directly inhibit the fungal growth in vitro. They increase the complement the position. They have centrifugal functions of macrophages in all the cases. And they protected marine models of uh, uh, animals in marine models of stoplasmosis, candidiasis, aspergillosis. We also have results on the cryptococcosis model. And they have become a new alternative for the treatment of endemic mycosis. Of course, we still have a, have a long way to go in terms of evaluation of these molecules and changing the FC parts in case if you want to move to the uh, uh, human studies. And I just want to finish by thanking all my collaborators. I'm not going to go through all the, the, the whole list, but the two uh, people mainly responsible for these studies here are my two PhD students, Susana Ruiz Mendoza and Mariana Ferreira. Mariana is now here in Texas. Now I'm actually in Texas now. <laughs> Uh, and uh, she's doing, uh, she's uh, spending one year with Dr. Igor Almeida making new versions of electing FC fusion proteins. So I just want to finish by thanks again, thanking again the, the invitation to talk in the, the same bath. And Lucy Mar, thank you very much again for having me talking in the, this event. Thank you. Oh, thanks for being here, Alain. Oh, uh, that was an amazing talk. A really nice contribution, uh, really nice images. Um, I think that we don't have any question in the chat box, but uh, I'd like to ask you uh, a question. Okay. Um, we know uh, that dectin one binds to the pump beta glucans. Yeah. But uh, we also know that some fungi can mask a pump from the immune system exposing alpha-glucan instead of beta-glucan. Have you studied if this effect could impact the lactin dectin one fc activity? Yeah, so in the, in the case specifically of histoplasma, we use two different strains. One of them is the G217B. Uh, it has no alpha-glucans on the surface. And the second one we used was the G186 that, yes, has an outer layer of alpha-1,3 glucan. But we do see the same binding of the, uh, the WGAFC and the Dactin FC against both strains. So it seems that even if the, 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 the fungus has an alpha-glucan uh, coating the, the, the beta-1,3 glucan, at some point when the cell is dividing, or any other mechanism that the better one to look and gets exposed, and that's how our lactin FC works. Ah, okay, great. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't know if there is a question. No questions here. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have a time for any for the question because the time. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Alan. Okay, Lucima, and uh, I just wanna. Thank you again. I, I, I've seen you. You guys are behind the schedule, so that's why I try to rush a little bit. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank uh, you for having me here. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, well, let's keep going to the select abstract presentation session. Um, Pedro Barbosa, would you like to introduce? Uh, he's a master's student at the Microbiology Institute in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and he will talk about antivirulence activity of the coordination compound CTP containing 110 phenantrolene and theophylline on secreted aspartic peptidase produced by non albicans candida species. Pedro, your talk should last 10 minutes, and then we'll open for audience questions, okay? Okay. Uh, can you confirm that I'm sharing my presentation? Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'll start. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Like I said, my name is Pedro Fernandes Barbosa. I'm a student from the UFRJ, and I'm a member of the Limer Laboratory. So, I'd like to start thanking the organization for this opportunity to talk a little about my work. So, I'm currently working on this project, which has the title of Antivirus Activity of the Coordination Compound, CTP, contain 110 phenantrolin and theophylin on secret aspartic peptidase produced by non albicans candida species. So in the last years, we saw an increase in infections caused by non albicans candida species, 
And such species are of great concern because they present significant resistance to the most common antifungal agents, which can lead to therapeutic failures, but also creates a huge problem when you think about treatment options for those infected patients. And because of that, we live in a time that the discovery of novel anti-candida targets, new bioactive compounds, and new strategies is something that is urgently required. And our group has been working with new de the development of new strategies, such as this new antivirus perspective. So this perspective is based on the selection or the development of new antivirulence agents that are capable of inhibiting the production of a main microbial factor that is relevant for the virulence. And as a consequence, could you also block or inhibit the development of the infectious process at the end? So based on, the, based on that, when we talk specifically about candida species, what candida molecules could be exploited as a potential therapeutic target? So like was said, my work is focused on the secret as part peptidase that by definition are enzymes capable of promoting the hydrolysis of peptidic bonds in proteins. So those enzymes have been already very well associated in literature as a major violence factor for candida species because they present many biological functions for the cells, such as in a physiological context, so they can help in the nutrition process, growing proliferation of the yeast, differentiations, and many other paths, but they also are very important when we think about the pathological context that these is can present because they have been already associated with uh, improvements on adhesion tissue invasion, um, more prolonged intracellular survival, the escape of host immune response, and many other functions. And those functions combined can also boost the final infectious process. So based on that, We've been studying a new uh, hypothesis. That is, if we discover or if we have a new drug that are capable of inhibit those enzymes or block or bind into those enzymes, this drug could also block these many biological roles uh, and important functions. And at the end, could also disrupt the infectious process as a final consequence. So based on that, our group has been studying this new coordination compound that is called CTP. So CTP was synthesized by our collaborators in the South Africa University. So CTP is synthesized by the binding of a central copper ion with two theophylline molecules and a one 110 phenontrolin molecule. So the final complex will present this unique structure that is different from the structure presenting the antifungal agents. And the selection of those three molecules here at the final design is based on many antifungal properties that has been already described in literature. So this new compound could present a promising uh, development strategy for anti-candida infections. So based on that, our group has very recently published a work where we saw this property. So we could assess this antifungal potential of this new complex against several drug resistant candida species. So this was a very positive uh, development because based on that, we've been studying different approach with this compound and those candida species, such as the present work that my work right now has the aim to investigate the antivirus activity of this coordination compound CTP on steps of clinical isolates of six different non albicans candida species, the six here, the six species here described, by using, sorry, by using in silico and in vitro approach. So based on that, our first uh, approach was to investigate if CTP could present an inhibitory effect on the growth of all clinical isolates when cultivating the YCB BSA medium, that is a well-known SAPS inducer medium, because in this medium, we only have BSA as, and BSA is a protein, so is our primary nitrogen source, what stimulation do the production of those enzymes, 
And for all of our studies, we also had a C Albicans, a GCC for comparative analysis. So we were able, by doing a mic assay, we are able were able to classify these inhibitory effects as a dose dependent effect. So as we can see here, at a, our higher concentrations, treatment constants range, all in micromolar, are capable of significant reducing the significant, promote significant inhibitions on the cell growth when we compare to lower concentrations. So based on that, this allowed us to calculate the MIC50, which is the concentration capable of reducing 50% of that, so, of that cell growth for all species. And our values are, were ranging from 40.8 to 70.7. .7. So we created an uh, initial hypothesis that maybe the, that inhibitory effects that we saw could be association with difference in the BSA consumptions pattern from this species. Uh, like I said, BSA is the main protein in the growth medium. So to further investigate that, we did a SDS page approach. So here at the results, we are seeing at the sides, the BSA protein profile, the growth of the different candida species in our inducer medium, and the treatment of CTP for this species by using our higher concentration in, that was used in the MyKSA, which was 400 micromolar. So we can see here, and I will demonstrate by highlighting the Candida albicans species, that CTP was able to inhibit this consumption in the 48 hours period. So as we can see, the treatment blocks or inhibits this BSA consumption when we compare to the growth control. And this is something that was true for all of our seven species. Here we show, we show in some examples, but it's something that was true for all isolates. And we also could, was a, were able to investigate that when we prolong this treatment time, so by doing the same approach, but in the 120 hours, we saw that those MIC50 values are even lower when compared to the 48 hours period. And as we can see here, the inhibition of effects was even more significant when we compare to the 48 hours approach that I uh, already have been demonstrated. So based on that, we start to believe in that this compound could be affected in a more specific way, the enzymatic activity presented uh, on those class of aspartic peptidase. And to further investigate that, we first did, sorry, we first did um, BSA agar plate test assay. So we analyzed the difference present in the diameter of the BSA hydrolysis halo. So here, first to better understand, man, higher PZ values are associated with a weaker enzymatic activity. So here we use the, also a different treatment strategy by using CTP on concentrations ranging from 100 to 12.5. And as we can see for all isolates, our highest concentrations present in this test, that is 100 micromolar and 50 micromolar, were able to reduce the, the, the secretion of aspartic peptidase by doing these agar plate tests. And the, this was something that was true for all isolates, as we can see on the graph. So based on that, to further investigate if SAPs could, if CTP could block the enzymatic activity of SAPs, we also did a quantification of the secret proteolytic activity by using a specific substrate that is catepsin D, that is a well-known substrate for analysis of the class of aspartic peptidase. And we also did two different treatment approaches one using our compound CTP and another using pepstatin A that is also very well known in literature as a classical inhibitor of uh, the class of aspartic peptidase. And by that, by doing that, we're um, able to calculate the IC50 values that are the values capable of, the concentration capable of reducing 50% of this activity. So first for our, our classic inhibitor, we saw that those values for all species were ranging from 4.62 to 
to 6.85, which is very low values, but it's something that was expected, expected because, like I said, it's a classical inhibitor. But when we did the same treatment strategy with CTP, we saw that our compound has very positive results. So those same values were ranging from 6.86 to 11.93, which are also very low values that uh, demonstrate the potential of this compound against the sepsis activity, and also presents a very similar pattern when we compare to a classical inhibitor. So demonstrating the compound's potential. And to further investigate if CTP could promote this, uh, this bind, this, in, this specific interaction with SAPS enzymes, we use the, the, uh, the structure of four different SAPS from four, four different candidate species by doing molecular docking analysis. So as we can see here, are our four enzymes from four species. CTP could bind in the, sorry, CTP binds in the catalytic site of these enzymes. So as you can see here that the compound in yellow interacts with amino acids present in this catalytic site, which boosts the creation of an inhibitor enzyme complex that could reduce the SAPS activity. That was something that we already saw in our biological tests. So based on that, we demonstrated here also the smart binding free energy of these four interactions of the four SAPs, four species SAPs. So we can see here, this interaction uh, presents very low values with something very positive because demonstrating a stronger binding energy, yeah, a stronger binding activity. So, so based on all of our results until this present time. We've been, I would like to demonstrate some future perspectives. We've been studying now in vivo approach by using the Galera Melonella model. So here we demonstrate the toxicity assays with different concentrations of this compound and this model. And, this model. and as we can see here, CTP has low toxicity. It only presents some patterns in much higher concentrations and this, those concentrations here present are even higher from that, the concentration that I'm using in my test, my project right now. But we also did the uh, early result. This is a prime uh, preliminary result by doing an infection assay with the multi-resistant fungi Candida auris. So as you can see here, when we did the infection only with these, all of the larvas, um, uh, have low percent survive. They all of that were dead in a 48 hours period. But when we did the same approach with different treatments of CTP at different concentrations, as we can see in our graph, we have a more prolonged uh, percent survival. So demonstrating um, in an early approach the potential of CTP and prolonged the survival and as uh, primarily treatment test. So this will require further investigations, but it's a very early positive result for our project. So uh, to finish, I would like to thank all the institutions and our collaborators that uh, have been promoting this project. I would like to thank again the organization for the selection of this opportunity to talk a little about my research. And I would like to thank everyone here for the attention and I hope you liked uh, this project. Thank you, Pedro. That was a nice talk. <laughs> Let's see if there is a question here. Okay, Teca Galvão is asking, what was the method used to determine the binding free energy? So we did uh, this binding free energy that I presented in the last slides were assessed by one of our collaborators in Portugal. So he did the molecular docking analysis and simulation the distance, the kind of the interaction, uh, if our hydrogen bonds, electrostatic and classify this interaction and the distance present of the structure of our compound with the amino acids present in the catalytic site of the of septic enzymes. 
from those species that have demonstration. So by doing that, and by using uh, engineer programs and all the bioinformatics part, he sent to us to contribute to this project. And it was calculated based on that, on the kinds of interaction between the compound and those enzymes, the distance present in the amino acids, and the, the free energy of the ligation, the interaction, that I demonstrated that has lower values, were classified by lower values because they have a genomic bank and could see the very well those enzymes structure that has been already classified. Great, Pedro. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question, a general question. Uh, I know that your focus is the antiviral activity, but yeah. what is the advantage of TTP compound compared to conventional antifungal drugs, considering toxicity, cost? Yeah, so I've been working with this compound since my graduation project. So this work right now is focused in the antivirus perspective, but we have already seen not only in our published work that this compound presents antifungal properties, but in my, under my project in the time of the graduation, we saw that this compound can interact with many cell targets at the same time. So they present not only the antifungal properties, antivirus properties, but they can, but it can interact with the biofilm and disrupts initial phase of biofilm and pre-established biofilm, it can target many uh, vital cell targets at the same time. So in the membrane, it can induce the, uh, the production of ROS. Uh, it uh, leads to lower levels of adhesion in many materials at the same time. So I think that the primary advantage of this compound is this wild uh, range of targets at the same time. So we know, like was said in the uh, early presentation, that the classical antifungal agents have a more specific way of targeting fungal cells. But this compound, we are, already saw that they can interact with many biological functions, many processes at the same time. So I think this is the primary advantage of using our compound by and something that we will analyze with future tests. Okay, Pedro, nice. Uh, there is a, a question, uh, Leticia's question, uh, curiosity. What yeah. is the sequence diversity and percentage identity among the SAPs from the species you've tested? Yes, this is something that we want to further analyze. We have already, uh, we didn't do that yet, but we know that in SAPs we have very, uh, very similar regions with SAPs from other species, but we have the portion that is more variable. So we want to classify those sequence and analyze the difference present on the, those amino acids because we've demonstrated that this compound can target specific, the specific sequence present only in candida species. It's a very positive result. It contributes for all that we have been already saw, but this is something that we didn't done yet, but it's in a future perspective. So I have uh, one more year to work on this project. This mm -hmm. is only the first step right, until now. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Pedro. I think we don't have much uh, any uh, any question. Uh, then uh, we really appreciate your participation. Thank you very much. You. I would like to call Talita to introduce the next speaker. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this one. And um, we just had so wonderful talk. Talita, your voice is... Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, that was okay. Oh, thank you. So we just had two wonderful talks on the fungal uh, world, but now we are going back to bacterial world. And I would, look, I would like to introduce Dr. Ivano de Philips Capasso. He's a senior 
scientist curator of the collection of environments and clinical micro microorganisms organis and the reference bacteria collection on how on health sur surveillance at the uh, Fiocruz. He has been working on development and innovation of the new bacteria di diagnos diagnos diagnostic methods, and he's going to talk about one of them. So, Ivano, thank you for accepting our invitation. And uh, you you have 20, 25 minutes uh, plus five minutes of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Talita. Uh, let me, okay. So I think it's not the full screen, right? Not yet. What? What do I have to do? I don't um, know. Yeah. Ivano, you can Sim. go up to exhibit configurations to the left. Ah, okay. Uh, uh -huh. yep. Yeah. And there, duplicar. Duplicar. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for the for having me in this, this important meeting about bacteria, fungi, and Every year we have this meeting, it's very, very interesting. And I'm gonna talk about uh, something that we will be working for many years. And now we finally have a, a, a finished product. Uh, this is uh, a method for detection of bacterial meningitis by, by real-time PCR with uh, high resolution melting. So, bacterial meningitis, uh, we, we say meningitis, but actually we should say invasive disease. This bacteria, uh, meningococci, pneumococci, and hemophilia influenza are the most important bacteria that cause invasive disease, which means sepsis and meningitis or sepsis or meningitis, depends on the, on the patient. Uh, and these are very important uh, etiological agents for this for these diseases, because it's uh, they are diseases very severe diseases with rapid evolution, and they, you have a case fatality rate about fifteen to twenty percent. There was once uh, uh, an outbreak in Bahia here in Brazil on a rave with many uh, young young adults and I mean adolescents and uh, they ha we have uh, about 11 cases in one night with seven deaths so it's sometimes it could reach 50% of case, fat case fatality rate it's very very severe and we have in brazil now these days we have about 1000 to 3000 cases per year for each of these, of this, uh, depending on the, on the etiological agent. And we have about 150 to 600 deaths per year. So it's very important to uh, diagnostic very rapid this, this, this disease. Uh, by the time that the, the patients present the first symptoms that may be high fever, uh, uh, head aches, uh, stiffness on the neck, uh, then to he can go he can go to death in 24 hours. So the differential diagnosis, if it's a virus, a fungi, or or a bacteria, in which type of bacteria, it's very important to improve the prognosis for this patient. The the gold standard uh, detection and uh, diagnostic. Uh, methodology nowadays for many infectious disease is the real-time uh, PCR or qPCR, which has increased in sensitivity, and the results are 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 given in real time. There is no subjectivity, no need to gel analysis or something like that. The computers told to say to you what what is what is the result, uh, and there are some commercial PCR kits 
with the methods called uh, the real time method called TACMI. Uh, you can have kits for COVID, for, uh, for hepatitis, for many, many diseases, and also for meningitis. But all these methods use the TACMAN technology, which I, I'm going to show you a little bit further. Uh, we are, we develop a method, uh, a method, the method was already, already described, of course, but we use the method, this method, and we adapted this method to, to make the diagnostic with high resolution met- uh, melting or HRM, which has the same sensitivity and specificity for the TACMAN, but a very low cost. So it's much cheaper than TACMAN. And the uh, limit of detection, TACMAN and HRM, is the, it's about the same, 200 femtogram per microlite. So uh, TACMAN uses fluorescent probes. Uh, these probes to, 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 to show to the, to the thermocycle, which, which is the target that has been amplified, must be important. And you have to use one different probe for each target that you are using. In this case, three targets, three different probes. And this is, is it increases the cost of the overall reaction. So these probes are very expensive. And uh, so HRM use one single fluorescent saturating dye. It's not a probe. Uh, it's not, it, you can use, you can use, uh, national, uh, reagents for this, for this fluorescent dye. There are many of them saturating. So very low cost and has the same sensitivity and specificity of technique. So, so how is the PCR TACMAN technology? PCR TACMAN, I think many, many, many people, many researchers know you have two pair of primers. You have, uh, and you have the probe that hybridizes to the DNA, the target DNA. Then you have the, the amplification and degradation of the, of the, of the, of the probe. And this release the fluorescence saying that you showing that you have a target amplification and then you can, uh, give your results. Uh, this is a, a normal uh, amplification tool for the real time PCR TACMA. When you have uh, the CT with cycle threshold, which is the the point or where the uh, the width point of the amplification, you started to see the the amplification of the target. Uh, this is an uh, an example of uh, uh, some approach for the identification of these these very same uh, agents with three different uh, uh, probes. And uh, for for pneumonia, influenza, and meningitis. Now, how is the high resolution melting technology? You can use uh, cyber green. It's very popular. Has been, has been used a lot for for real time PCR. But cyber green is is a non saturating uh, intercalating dye. With that, this means that uh, cyber green does not b- bind. To all the hydrogen bonds between the two bases of the double helices of the DNA, so you can have some of the of the bonds with without uh, fluorescence. So it's not very good for IHRN. So there will be developed other other uh, dye, fluorescent dye, call it saturating dye, like evergreen. It's one of them. And it is, is a saturating dye. It means that it bonds to every and sing, each single uh, bonds of the DNA, where you have the, the C, T, and C, uh, A, T, and C, G bonds. So all the DNA, it's, it's bond with, with uh, fluorescent dye that can be uh, detected by the thermocycle, the real time thermocycle. So we developed this, this method. Uh, we have a patent application already in 2018. We, we got this, uh, this patent. And after that, we, uh, a few years after that, we, um, uh, published a paper with, uh, with this, uh, approach to new diagnostic method. Uh, our, 
our uh, targets were three exclusive genes of each of each uh, microorganism: NSPA for Neisseria meningitis, P6 for hemophilia influenza, and PLE for streptococcal pneumonia. These are uh, genes that exist only in these species. So we tested with many other species uh, that normally can cause uh, meningitis, and there was no amplification from other species, only for these three. And with this, we determined the, the, the melting temperature that indicates specifically each of the targets, which is different for each one. You can see on the right here, you can see uh, 80, 85.8 for meningitis, 80 for hemophilia influenza, and 77 for streptococcal pneumonia. <coughs> this is the, the one of the, the way that you can see the, the result with three curves and at different temperatures that shows uh, the specificity for each target. What is important here for this technology is the is the cost. You can see that uh, using uh, for bacterial genomic de detection using uh, for HRM using a um, uh, milk doctor, which is a, a, a kit of master mix kit for from in, in vitro gen. You can use others. You will spend thirteen reais or. Two point six dollars for each for each sample. You have other ways to, with commercial kits, to detect these these agents. You can use uh, serology agent uh, uh, antigen detection for these three targets, which is very low, which has very low sensitivity. It's more for epidemiological studies, and it's expensive. I don't have the prices here. And you have the bacterial genomic DNA detection by TACMA. You have a, a, a kit, a commercial kit that cost to can, can cost to 75 up to 150 reais, which is 15 to 30 dollars per sample for each sample. Uh, and you can use also uh, endpoint PCR, but the sensitivity is lower and it's subjective because you have to. Look at the results to in a jail, a Garosa jail. So, which are the conclusion? With the, this is the first report of a HRM for rapid and cost-effective diagnostic of bacterial meningitis. You can have a simultaneous detection of the three most frequent bacterial agents, uh, meningitis invasive disease, and with the same sensitivity and specificity of the gold standard uh, standard uh, TACM. And the overall uh, re uh, reagent costs or HRM are about 20% of the TACMIN system. Well, the perspectives is that uh, uh, HRM may be used in many several public hospital laboratory, LASING, and it's a very, very cost-effective new diagnostic tool. And in this way, you can distribute for many public laboratories, even in developing country, uh, so many, many people can benefit from this. You can have uh, uh, this kit ready to be used for any suspected meningitis case that enter in the hospital and rapidly determine if it is one of the three agents and so give the appropriate uh, outcome from, this, from these cases. And this will be certainly improve the diagnosis of meningitis and uh, avoid death or sequela for, this, for these patients. Thank you very much. Once again, this is my contact and I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ivano. Uh, really nice talk. Um, we have one question here from Teca. Uh, what is the type of sample that can be used with this method? What is the type of the type yes. sample? Yes. Ah, okay. Yes, sure. Uh, good question. Uh, like PCR, you can use uh, cerebrospinal fluid or blood uh, because this uh, who works this with this uh, microorganism 
know that are very difficult to to isolate. So it's it's very difficult to have the micro uh, isolate to, to make the all the tests. So you can collect uh, uh, the spinal fluid or even blood, depending of the of the symptoms of the of the patient. And then uh, with a simple technique, a PCR technique, you can make the diagnostic very fast. So I have one question. You mentioned that uh, you tested for other bacteria that cause meningitis, right? Yeah. Uh, my question, this method can be applied for other disease, other bacteria, can be sure. modified. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, how and how close this method uh, is to be using uh, in the hospital routine? You you said uh, you showed in you know last uh, last slide that uh, this method can be used just uh, for the diagnosis in the hospital, but uh, how close is is this to happen? Well, uh, <laughs> today. Uh, I, I think that many, I, I would not say every last thing, you know, last thing, right? Uh, but many of them, they have a real time thermocycle because mm -hmm. you have many, uh, kits, commercial kits for, for hepatitis, for HIV, for many. Others. So you can use the same machine. You only have to have the kit with the, with the master mix and uh, the reagents and put into the machine and then you have the results. So it's not difficult. Okay. And uh, and you can you can adapt. I mean, you of course you have if you want to to detect, for example, we are we are have we have other uh, projects with uh, with um, uh, bacteria resistant antimicrobial resistance of bacteria. So we can use this method to detect anti anti uh, resistant genes from Escherichia coli, uh, Klebsiella, or other, other strains. So you just okay. have to study the genes that you want to target, uh, design the, the primers, test, and then you have the the, the method ready. It's easy. Okay. Uh, we have uh, one more question here uh, from Leticia. Could you tell us a little bit more on how to go from development to the perspectives that is production of production and distribution of the public health, health system. system. Uh -huh. Sure, good. Uh, we have already a patent. Uh, the the pro the kit is ready to be scalonate in a pilot uh, test. Uh, we are in in conversation with the Instituto de Biologia Molecular do Paraná, which helped us a lot in developing this kit. And uh, we are now also seeking for other companies that will have interest to make a pilot uh, pilot kit and uh, start to validate distributing with uh, public laboratory like La Seine, some La Seine, and use this to validate. And then we can uh, see if the some company can be interested in uh, in uh, produce the kit and. And then you use in the in the in the field. Okay. I think the last one is from Maria Elena. How could you improve TB meningitis using this platform? Yeah, TB meningitis diagnostic, right? Yeah, Same okay. thing. Just you have to, to to choose one exclusive gene for TB, one gene that exists only in TB that you can identify to be by amplifying this gene and and design and study this gene study and and design uh pyro primers for the ihrm uh, uh detection it's simple basic okay. molecular biology okay um thank you again Vano. thank you and um, now um uh, What's the next presentation? Can I go? Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Teca Galvão, researcher here at Teo Cruz, and it's a pleasure to be here today with everyone who's watching now or later. 
Um, the symposium is intended for integrating researchers with students trying to stimulate collaborations. And I've noticed that since we started yesterday, there have been very few questions from students coming from YouTube. So I'm taking a moment to stimulate you to ask questions. You know, um, Tadita is here uh, as a PhD student. She just shared um, one of the presentations. Our following speaker is just finishing his PhD. Our previous speaker before Yvonne was a PhD student. So maybe, you know, in one or two years time, you're gonna be here giving your presentation. And it's nice to just feel confident to know that the questions that you have may be questions that other people have. So I'm sure that if you put something in the chat, it will also be other people's doubts. And so um, in that way, we can really propagate knowledge and um, just also let this be an experience in which you, you know, get some jogo de cintura to, to participate in a scientific event. So without saying any more about this, and I do expect some questions now that I've made this, um, this point, please do send us some questions in the chat. Um, even to, I, in, to value the, the, the work and time of our dear Juani Melio, who is going to present now on such a, an amazing topic as bacterial signaling. So Juan is, uh, as I said, finishing his PhD um, in the um, molecular and structural biology, um, molecular and structural microbiology lab in uh, Institut Pasteur Montevideo. And He's now working in the protein engineering unit, but this work I think was done in the uh, under supervision of Alejandro Boschiazzo, who's uh, yes. a great reference in Latin America for structural biology and also um, microbial genetics at, at the interface with structural biology. So it's really um, a special um occasion for me to host Juan, as this is um, at the interface with some of the projects that I have. And with that, I'd like to thank Juan for submitting your abstract. And the floor is yours. You have, I think, 10 minutes, right? Okay, uh, thank you, Teca, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, regulation of him and iron homeostasis in Leptospira. So Leptospira are a thin and spiral shaped uh, gram negative bacteria uh, who has internal flagella, periplasmic uh, flagella. They comprise both uh, free living and pathogenic species and the latter cause leptospirosis, which is a zoonotic disease spread uh, worldwide. So today I'm going to focus my talk on a signal transduction system called HEMKMR, which is a two component system in which uh, the first component is a HEMK, which is the sensor. It's a transmembrane histidine kinase, which upon a presence or absence of a given signal, environmental signal, it uh, dictates uh, phosphorylation levels of the second component, uh, which is HEMR, uh, which is a response regulator. So in this way, HEMR will act as a, as a transcription factor binding to DNA promoters and regulating gene expression. So HEMK can act both, both as a kinase or uh, a phosphatase um, because it is a multifunctional enzyme. So the questions that uh, we tried to answer uh, in my PhD work was first, which is the signal that is uh, detected by HMK regulating its activity? And then how does HMR trigger its response uh, upon this signal detection? So previous work showed that HMR is a dual transcriptional regulator involved in a regulation of uh, heme metabolism related gene expression. So, when the system MK HMR is on, it's in on state, uh, the kinase state of MK is activated 
and therefore phosphorylation uh, of HMR is occurring. HMK transfers phosphoryl group to HMR, uh, phosphorylating it and activating it, and allows it to bind to DNA promoters. Uh, and in this way, it will uh, stimulate uh, expression of the heme biosynthetic genes and repressing transcription of the heme catabolizing genes. This is the heme oxygenase gene more precisely. So in this way, it's a dual response regulator. So when the system is off, HEMAR is not phosphorylated. Actually, it's being dephosphorylated uh, through HEMK's phosphatase activity. Then it doesn't bind, uh, MR doesn't bind to DNA promoters, allowing him catabolism gene expression and inhibiting uh, the him biosynthetic gene expression. So uh, this is uh, the working hypothesis. Uh, uh, that is a kind of a summary that uh, it, the things that I said before. So the main topic was to address the, which is the signal that is uh, regulating this on off activity of MKHMR. So we have some uh, candidate signals. We work with this uh, uh, with these two candidate signals, which are iron and amino lebulinic acid. Uh, because of the time, I won't uh, be giving details now uh, about the rationale of the of, of why did you choose these candidate signals. I will be happy to answer questions if the discussion, if you will. So the first uh, approach was evaluating transcriptional response uh, of the heme biosynthetic gene HEMA and the heme catabolism gene HEMO, the hemoxygenase. In the model organism, Leptospira bifexa, which is a free-living bacteria, is a free-living species of Leptospira. And we have, uh, we count with the, both the wild type uh, strain and uh, a knockout uh, bacteria, which lacks the MK HMR system. So uh, upon signal incubation in cultures, we expected to see um, uh, changes in expression uh, of these genes upon presence of the candidate signal and not uh, and uh, a lack of response transcriptional re response with uh, in presence of the signal in the knockout so when we use amino lebulinic acid or ala as a as a signal we you can see that you you can see a response in the wild type strain but not in the knockout strain. Comparison between these two um, full changes, both HEMA and HEMO, are non-significant. So this result suggests, strongly suggests that transcriptional response to ALA um, is uh, mostly HEMKR dependent uh, in, uh, in these conditions tested. So we also uh, evaluate iron as a conate signal. Uh, we had some technical issues uh, evaluating iron excess, so I'm going. I'm not going to show that uh, those results. Um, instead, I'm going to show the iron depletion condition. We induce an iron depletion condition in in cultures using an iron chelator, uh, dipyridyl, and as you can see, we have uh, both in wild type and HMK HMR knockout uh, strains. We see a, a response in both cases, but uh, it's like a mixed, a, a partial HMK HMR dependent response with an independent response. Uh, for example, you can see that here in the wild type strain in iron depletion condition, HMA is down regulated, but here is up regulated in the knockout strain. So uh, we, think, we think that uh, HMK HMR is um, having something to do with this response. So we extended this uh, transcriptional analysis uh, to the whole transcriptome, uh, trying to first to look at uh, more genes that are may, that may be uh, that may be uh, regulated by the system. But uh, the thing that I want to show you now is that uh, Please look at this. All these all these dots are the the genes that are being trans, transcribed on both wild type and HMK HMR. In the x-axis, you can see 
default changes in wild type strain and in the y axis you can see the full change of the knockout strain so uh, as you can see with the treatment the treatment with amino lebulinic acid you can see that genes are being um, regulation uh, expression of genes is being affected along the y axis you can see here uh, down regulated genes like uh, minus 2 log full change or or here that are up regulated, but not in the y axis. Uh, they are around the uh, non fold change. So, this uh, flattened dot distribution indicates a HEM KMR dependent response. In contrast, uh, with uh, the iron depletion condition, you can see that the dot distribution is diagonal. So, we see not only fold changes uh, occurring in the wild type. Uh, strains, but also in the HEM KMR knockout strain. So, uh, taking together all these results, uh, we saw that incubation with ALA, with amino lebulinic acid, triggers an overall HEM KMR dependent response. So, the, uh, finally, we evaluated, uh, we tried to evaluate uh, through a more direct method the activation state of HEMAR, looking at whole protein extracts of the Leptospirabil Fexa wild type strain incubated with these uh, candidate signals. Um, for that, we used a variation of the STS page with this molecule, FOSTAG, that's, that allow us to see a shift in phosphorylated um, proteins of a, of a protein population. So here you can see the HEMAR, uh, we also did Western blot with anti-HEMAR antibodies in order to, to look just, uh, just to HEMAR. And here you can see the shift in the mobility of the phosphorylated protein. And uh, as you can see, when incubated with ALA, you can see a complete phosphorylation after one hour of treatment and not uh, in the presence of the iron chelator or an excess of iron. So. This, uh, these results indicate that amino lebulinic acid, but not iron, is a signal detected by HEM -R, HEM K, which is actually dephosphorylating HEMAR and inactivating it. Then we do we analyzed uh, a conjugant which harbors um, which was complemented with a, a HEM K HEMAR uh, gene, which has a constitutive kinase mutant of HEM K. We don't see any dephosphorylation in this case. So uh, we hear this result is suggesting, strongly suggesting that upon our sensing, MK dephosphorylates MR through its phosphatase activity. So uh, further directions of this work. Um, okay, this is the conclusion, the main conclusion. Uh, MK is sensing ALA in order to maintain him and iron homeostasis. Hemoxygenase has been documented as a virulence factor in pathogenic leptospira. So HEMK HEMAR emerges as a relevant system regulating pathogen, pathogenicity and virulence. So we will try to extrapolate these results which were done in a free living uh, leptospira to a pathogenic strain in, in which HEMK HEMAR regulates the same genes and in the free living uh, in the species. And also, we'll try to evaluate if there is a cognate signal that turns on the MKHMR system, um, or it's being like a, a housekeeping, uh, or the system is a housekeeping uh, constitutively on that is being shut off with uh, with ALA uh, or other signals that haven't been tested yet. So this is the lab. Uh, I would like to thank everyone because. Uh, they are, all, uh, they are great uh, lab mates and uh, are probably watching. So, uh, so thank you very much for them. And thank you all for your attention and again for the opportunity. Thank you, Juan. Um, let me see if there's any questions. Um, hopefully someone who's watching, one of the students watching is going to send some questions. Um, and in the meantime, um, w what would you say is the reason that the 
iron chelator um, affected gene expression in the HEMKR mutant? Okay, so uh, iron depletion ha has been uh, what we saw in the in the experiment is that iron depletion and also what have have been observed before in other uh, work in other works previously done is that iron depletion is a really strong signal that affects a lot of genes so uh, here with uh, uh, particularly with mk hamar what we see is that mk hamar is somehow regulating uh, in an indirect way because its phosphorylation state is not uh, being changed. But uh, what we see is that maybe there is, there is some regulator that is being uh, regulated uh, through HEMKHMR, which is, uh, for example, uh, inducing this, uh, this change in HEMA expression uh, from down-regulated in the wild type to up-regulated in the, in the knockout strain. But uh, as the RNA-seq results uh, suggest, uh, iron depletion is a signal that affects a lot of genes, which, uh, which is kind of uh, um, uh, not obvious, but it's, it's expected to, to behave uh, since there are a lot of networks that are being uh, changed in the, uh, within the cell. Right. Um, there's... Um... There is question in in the chat. We have some people that are congratulating you on your work, um, yes. and so I'll ask another question uh, related to HMK. Um, you didn't present this work, so I'm not sure if if it's known or if you if you have this information, but. Um, how would you uh, predict the interaction of the ALA substrate or inducer rather to um, interact with the HEMK kinase? Was this something that you had any previous information on? So the, are you asking me for the rationale of, the, of choosing ALA as a signal? Yes. Okay. So, uh, briefly, uh, aminolevulinic acid is the precursor of the hymbiosynthetic pathway. Not only, not only of him, but all porphyrins. Uh, it is worth uh, of note. So, uh, choosing of aminolevulinic acid as a signal was a rather empirical um, uh, election because I will, I was. Uh, doing some real-time PCR uh, assays with uh, Leptospira bifexa, both wild type and MK MR. And I systematically saw um, a stimulation of expression of the, of the heme oxygenase gene and a repression of the, of the, of the HEMA gene uh, in, in cultures that, that had ALA, that were, were supplemented with ALA, so and, and not in the in the knockout strain when trying to evaluate other signals that uh, resulted not to have any effect on transcriptional response. Uh, so th these empirical uh, observations uh, made me think that well, amino -lebulinic acid is synthesized, but these two enzymes HEMA and HEMAL in a in HEMAL in a sequencing in a sequential manner, and uh, also consuming ATP and reducing power, and also a charged uh, a tRNA charged amino acid. So, if the I, I what I reasoned is was is that if amino lewinic acid is already present in the medium, uh, you will not uh, need the HMA uh, a transcription of HMA molecule to, in order to synthesize. Uh, the already present amino lewinic acid. So um, it goes in, in that way. But of course, the mechanism in which, uh, by which HMK senses amino lewinic acid has not been tested yet. And it's, um, it's uh, also a perspective 
um, try to understand how Allah is being uh, is interacting either with MK or another auxiliary module that acts as a, as a sensor. Fantastic. Um, that's great. No more questions coming from the chat. So with that, I'd like to thank you once again. Thank you the previous speakers and everyone who's been here with us today. We have the last day tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We have talks, um, very interesting talks starting uh, the, the symposium tomorrow by Carlos Martin, who is one of the leaders of uh, something that started as a research project and that is now one of the more, most exciting possibilities for new TB vaccines um, that's in already in advanced phase clinical trials with babies in South Africa, if I'm not wrong. So don't miss that talk. Um, and we also have talks tomorrow. Where am I? The 23rd uh, by a student at Fiocruz uh, and other colleagues from Europe, um, in England and Spain, and from different pathogens, plant pathogens, um, animal and human pathogens and fungal pathogens, candida albicans. So don't miss our symposium tomorrow. Um, look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Juan.